Hello, thanks for listening. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and this is a presentation on the short article by Amy Cunningham, Why Women Smile. As the title suggests, Cunningham's purpose in this article is to explore the reasons why women smile, particularly women in modern American culture, that is, late 20th century, early 20th, 21st century American culture. And in the course of this short essay, she talks a little bit about her personal experience. She talks about the psychological and physiological or biological reasons why we smile, the ways in which uh, smiles are uh, an adaptation of behavior, of animal behavior. And she talks about smiles as a social or cultural uh, phenomenon, that is, why women in culture or how women's emotions are represented in society, what, what emotions women are allowed. And she talks a little bit about the history, the changing history of women's emotions in society and what place women's emotions have. And ultimately, what is her purpose here? Or what is, uh, why is she writing this article? Well, as she indicates at the beginning, she has this sense that smiling is something that is expected of women in a particular way um, and that, that those expectations are limiting, are repressive, are controlling. So this essay, we might say, is a, a kind of cultural analysis or social analysis, um, an analysis of the way people behave in our culture. And what she's trying to do, I think, is reflect on things that we take for granted, reflect on things that are just a part of our normal everyday life, a part of our general expectations, and encourage us to rethink those expectations, rethink the um, uh, things that we take for granted, and to reflect on our own behavior and beliefs. And if we could put Cunningham's idea into a, a simple statement, a sentence or two, it would be that in modern American culture, women are expected to portray a certain kind of harmless, uh, submissive happiness, and that women's emotions are limited because of the expectations. Women are, women are limited in, in the kinds of emotions that they can express and the kinds of lives that they can lead because of our expectations of how women should or shouldn't behave. So I want to talk about the organization of the article first. Now, we notice that it's organized into one, two, three, four chunks, uh, each one separated by um, some white space. And so just by going, looking at the, the visual organization, that gives us a clue that there's something different going on in each one of these sections. And now that we've read it, we can summarize basically um, what's happening in each of these sections. That gives us a sense of her logic, of how she's organizing this. Um, that gives us a model for our own writing to think of how we might um, explore a similar subject or how, how we might use this kind of structure, this kind of organization to do our own explorations in, in writing. And it also gives us um, uh, a starting point to look more deeply at the organization on a paragraph by paragraph level. So the first section um, is the introduction, right? Um, even though it's multiple paragraphs, we could say it serves the purpose of introducing the problem, the issue that she's concerned with, which is women smiling, um, and the expectations that are placed upon that we have about women smiling. And she introduces the issue of nature and nurture introduces the, the uh, tension between social expectation and behaviors that we're taught and our instincts as animals, the behaviors that have evolved uh, within us as social animals who have evolved to live together and to cooperate in, in order to survive. The second section, she goes into talking about the um, one of the aspects, one of the issues that she raises in the in introduction, and that's the uh, biological reasons um, why humans smile, how we learn to smile from our earliest ages as a child, what it means 
according to our current best scientific studies. And then she uses this to then move into the cultural differences, um, how in different countries and different cultures, smiling might mean different things, and there might be different reasons why people smile. So she introduces us to the biological and, and uh, sort of inborn psychological reasons why humans smile, and then uses that to start getting us to the differences. So she's not putting nature and nurture up against each other, as we might have expected, but rather showing how they combine, how nature and nurture work together in shaping um, our emotions and our emotional behaviors. The third section, then, is the longest, and it is the most diverse. Um, it, after talking about um, biological and cultural imperatives in terms of smiling, she then um, jumps back to the issue of expectations in America and the way women who smile or who don't smile, rather, are uh, viewed and what our specific cultural views are about women smiling. And she uses that as a way to introduce a history of this broader topic of women's emotion. So even though the title is Why Women Smile, she gets into a much broader issue, right? That is just the tip of the iceberg that allows her to say, say something not just about women smiling and that one particular behavior, but how women's emotions are represented in culture. And she talks a lot about the um, uh, different uh, paintings, history of painting, and um, advertising in, in other countries today. Um, and so she is using this, again, as a way to explore how women's emotions and their representation has changed over time. The reason why this is important is because, as I said before, she's asking us to think about things that we take for granted, to examine behaviors that we don't normally examine or think about. She's asking us to reflect on some things in a way that we might not have before. The question, why women smile, the answer to that question might just be, well, because they're happy. That's the obvious, that's the simple or common sense answer. But she's saying, no, there's something more complicated going on behind it. And it's not just about being happy, and it's not just about uh, a simple emotional reaction. Rather, our emotional reactions are very complex, and they, uh, uh, we display them in, in different ways, and that is ultimately shaped in, in the large part by our culture and our cultural expectations about how people should behave. The final section is the conclusion. Uh, just as the first section is a few paragraphs, but altogether they, f they, take the, they, they perform the function of introducing the topic, these last few paragraphs take the function of perform the function of concluding the essay. Now, as a good conclusion does, it returns back to some of the concerns that she introduced at the beginning, her own smile and her own sense of being limited by the expectations people place on her to always be smiling. But this isn't just a repetition of what she said at the beginning. Rather, she has traveled through these other ideas, this other information, and so now we have, and she has, a new perspective on that issue. And so we also see that there are, she is not alone in questioning the smiling of women. That, uh, for example, this media coach, Heidi Ber Berenson, um, is, is very uh, uh, focused on the power of smiling and how women can use smiles to, uh, to their advantage. She also talks about, uh, Cunningham, that is, talks about, writes about some shifts in our culture. How in certain contexts, for example, advertising, we can see that s women are being allowed a wider range of expressions. They are being shown with m different expressions. Women are being shown with uh, uh, in expressions of, of determination, of pain, of suffering, of strength um, in sports ads and things like that. So women are being assertive in a new way that they were not represented as such before. So she does this in order to show that, that she's gone through this uh, process of thinking about smiling and what it means and how it has changed over time and gotten to the point of it seeing certain changes going on in the present, certain changes going on around her. And these changes don't invalidate her thesis that um, women smile for certain 
cultural because of certain social and cultural pressures. Uh, I think it actually supports it by showing she's not alone in addressing this issue or being aware of this issue, and that once more, things are shifting, things are changing in what we as a culture find acceptable and allowable for women to express, um, what we will allow women to show and be in public. Okay, now that I've talked about the organization in general, I want to go to a more uh, detailed paragraph-by-paragraph paragraph, uh, look, and not to talk about all the ideas in it, but rather look at what Cunningham is doing and how each paragraph connects from one to the next. So in the first paragraph, notice how it's personal. She says, I find myself trying to quit smiling or seeking to lower the wattage of her smiles a bit. So she starts us off with something personal, and it's a rather sharp and, and striking and, and, and surprising claim saying, I'm not going to smile as much. It's a kind of an odd thing to start with. It, it, it grabs our attention um, because it's kind of startling, and we say, well, why? Why would someone want to stop smiling? What's the purpose behind that? So it's both personal, but it also reaches out to us because it says that's an interesting uh, phenomenon. That's a strange or unusual phenomenon, something I want to know more about. Why is this woman wanting to not smile as much as she did before? Um, so we have that very brief uh, sharp opening, and then quick transition in the second paragraph into the reactions, both negative and positive reactions to her personal uh, decision to try to stop smiling. And she says, not everyone likes this. Certain friends and relatives uh, are not happy about it, but the people who love me best agree that my smile hasn't been serving me well. So she draws this contrast notice between some people who think that if she's not smiling, she's not happy, people who expect her to smile, people who want her to smile, people who say, I think of you as a smiling person, and the other people who love her best and thus presumably know her best, know her better, and they are on her side. They are saying, yeah, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't be smiling as much. Maybe what you're trying to get and what you're trying to say about yourself isn't best served by smiling all the time. Now, once more, even though this is very personal in the sense that she's talking about her friends, her husband, um, the reason why she's talking about this or, or the effectiveness of this is that the reader can imagine themselves in a similar position. And, of course, we've all been in positions where some people uh, in our lives support us about something and others don't. And that kind of feeling of, uh, of, of resentment against the people who expect you to behave in a certain way, um, even if it doesn't make you happy, even if it's not true to you, and the thankfulness you have for those other people who are more understanding and who want you to be yourself. So, and it also, I think, then uh, uh, stands in as, as, a, as a kind of miniature version of wider social, the, the wider social expectations, how there are some people uh, and perhaps the majority of people who have expectations on how women should behave and present themselves in public versus other people like uh, Amy Cunningham, like some of the other people she discusses, presumably, who are more open to or who, who uh, uh, recognize that a woman or any individual needs to be able to express themselves um, in a way that's true to themselves, It'd be that they need to be able to freely express their emotions in a way that is true. So the personal experience, the split between people in her personal life uh, is a kind of stand-in or a miniature version of a larger social difference in attitudes. The third paragraph zooms out to a broader perspective. Um, after spending two paragraphs talking just about herself, she zooms out to smiles and American women in general. And notice how she starts this third paragraph. Smiles are not the small, innocuous things they appear to be. So another kind of striking line in that it challenges our expectations the first line, we were challenged because we expect someone to want to smile more. And now she's saying the way we think about smiles, what you think you know about smiles is not actually accurate, is not actually true. So uh, this is then now taking us from her personal experience into now being able to understand how her personal experience, her personal decision not to smile as much is reflective of or says something about a broader experience or the experience of uh, uh, women in the United States uh, on a much broader level.
and the next couple paragraphs continue this broader perspective. Uh, the next, the fourth paragraph that begins, we smile so often. Um, it's, it's, she's talking about smiles in our life and in a sense, and our being uh, American women primarily. And so by talking about all the places where we smile, uh, she's pointing out why it's relevant. Smiles are not as innocent as you think they are, and we smile all the time. So this is something that's more important than you might think. This is something that's more relevant than you might think at first, just from the, the title. And the last two paragraphs in this introduction, I think, get us into her specific argument or the specific topic that she's going to explore, the way she's going to explore it. Um, she begins by citing a well-known figure, Oscar Wilde, who, if you're not familiar with him, Oscar Wilde's an extremely famous uh, poet and dramatist um, and also a noted as an extremely witty man, extremely, extremely clever author uh, with many, many famous funny sayings like a woman's face is her work of fiction, the quote that um, Amy Cunningham uses. So she cites a well-known figure as a way into her analysis. That's a kind of um, uh, underneath the idea of a face as a work of fiction. Um, that's uh, a way to introduce her thesis about smiles being, in some sense, constructed, in some sense, fictional. That is not necessarily to say false, but telling a story that might not be the entirely true story. And she introduces here the issue of nature and nurture. She introduces how, uh, on some hand, uh, I there's some research that suggests that, that girls smile more because of the way their brains de uh, uh, develop quicker. And on the other hand, very clear, very obvious cultural reinforcements of certain behaviors by women. And the last paragraph of the introduction um, introduces us to this idea, this very uh, striking sense of um, being non-threatening, being submissive, uh, saying that we have this instinct that uh, our, in our, our smiling develops from um, greetings that monkeys would give to one another, a behavior to show that they're not threatening, to show that they're not trying to compete for dominance, to show submission. Um, and so she is, uh, I think, and, and notice it's a very striking end by declaring ourselves non-threatening and our smiles provide, our smiles provide an extremely versatile means of protection. Um, that break there heightens the effect of that last sentence that not only is she talking about how women have been uh, trained to smile in some sense by culture, but that there is a uh, kind of almost insidious purpose behind it or, or uh, an insidious consequence, which is that it makes women take on the role of uh, more submissive, uh, of the more submissive gender. It makes women present themselves as non-threatening, present themselves as weak, present themselves as not assertive, not uh, powerful, not in control. And that so ultimately might suggest that this is part of um, one strand of the general way in which our society, in which women are treated as less equal. Women are kept unequal to men. Moving into the second section, this is where she first introduced us to um, the biological development of humans as how we develop from our infancy and how smiling, uh, why we smile at different stages in our development, when smiling becomes an authentic behavior, uh, and what are the causes of it. And she begins at the beginning. She begins when we are babies. And so the first two paragraphs um, are about, uh, actually three paragraphs really, are about when we are infants and children. And why does she, well one, why does she go back all this far? Partially it's to get us again to reflect on a situation, reflect on aspects of ourselves that are not easily there for us to see. We don't remember what we're like when we're babies. We don't remember uh, a lot of our childhood. We don't know, we can't tell for ourselves when we started smiling authentically and when smiling was just a kind of imitative behavior. So she gives us this scientific information to put our individual lives and our individual experiences in a larger context, in a larger uh, perspective. 
And she talks about some of the reasons why people smile as uh, a way to bond with others, as a way to uh, as an expression of joy. Um, and also, of course, the the interesting phenomenon of smiling and laughing with relief when you learn something that you thought was dangerous isn't dangerous. And so all of this, I think, is she's she's putting uh, uh, she's drawing a kind of universality underneath all of our experiences. We've all gone through this. We've all had similar experiences. We all have developed in some sense in the same way. So regardless of our individual experiences, our individual differences, there is this commonality uniting us. Then, however, in the next paragraph that starts from the wilds of New Guinea, she introduces a difference. Um, however, in many places, in other countries, in other cultures, smiles can be used to express all sorts of different emotions. Um, fright, embarrassment, anger, uh, to hide pain, to hide sorrow, right? So smiles are not just even though there is a certain commonality, there's also difference. There's also a variety or diversity. So this is, I think, again, part of her project to uh, show how smiles, uh, how something that seems so simple, seems so obvious, something that we take for granted, is much more complex than we had previously thought, and that by investigating this, this uh, seemingly simple topic, we actually learn a lot about ourselves and some of our uh, hidden biases and hidden uh, expectations and beliefs. And then she ends the second section with a paragraph that does two things, um, and again, it has a kind of striking end. First, it culminates this scientific and, and uh, developmental discussion of smiling uh, with the information from psychologist Paul Ekman and about the 18 different types of smiles and the ways in which um, smiling uh, uh, certain physical behavior, certain physical reactions, signal uh, the authenticity of emotion behind a smile. So on the one hand, it culminates the, the developmental discussion that she's been given, the history of how we develop from childhood to adulthood and, and uh, how we learn what smiling means uh, and learn how to smile, you might say. And then it also gives a sh quick shift, takes us back to her main topic, why do women smile? If this is um, what smiling means developmentally, if these are the psychological reasons why people smile. What about American women? And goes back to her idea that American women smile because they are forced to, because they are expected to. And so the smiles, at least some of the smiles that women uh, <laughs> give, that women smile, um, are not authentic, are not expressing true emotion, true happiness, but expressing the, the feeling that one needs to smile. So this goes back to her, her thesis that there's a problem that, uh, that American women have this expectation placed on them. Um, and she ends this with, again, another striking sentence. Ekman insists that if people learn to read smiles, they could see the sadness, misery, or pain lurking there plain as day. With the implication there, that if many American women are not truly smiling, there must be a lot of frustration, of suffering uh, that's being hidden behind those fake smiles. This then serves as the setup for the beginning of the third and longest section. Evidently, a woman's happy, willing deference is something the world wants visibly demonstrated. So she ends one section by saying, if we were better at recognizing and reading faces, we could see the falsehood of women's smiles and then begins the next one saying, well, evidently, since we don't see the falsehood of women's smiles, what our expectation is, is that women should be happy. Women should be smiling all the time. That, that that is what we want. We don't want to see the truth. We want to see a visible demonstration of happiness, of deference. And she gives some examples of uh, things that would upset our day-to-day -day expectations, uh, a waitress, a personal assistant, a receptionist, a flight attendant, any other woman in a line of public service whose smile is not offered up to the boss or client as proof that there are no storm clouds, uh, metaphorically speaking. Women are expected to smile no matter where they line up on the social, cultural, or economic ladder. College professors are criti criticized for not smiling. 
political spouses, etc. So she gives all these examples, um, general examples, and then the next short paragraph, a personal example, again, about what people think when women aren't smiling. When women are smiling, they assume we're happy, but when women aren't smiling, that's when people get worried and they're not happy about it. They don't like it when women don't smile. So we want that image of happiness. We want that false image. We don't want to know the truth. That's what she's asserting here. Then with the word ironically, she takes us into, uh, and again, this section is about cultural expectations. If we, if we knew how to read faces, we would see that women aren't truly as happy as they pretend to be, but that's not what we want. We want to see women as happy. Um, ironically, though, she says, this is something that has changed over time. And so, again, this is part of strengthening her idea that smiling is not just a simple natural phenomenon. It's a complex cultural phenomenon with complex causes uh, and that, that shift and that adapt over time. And she says 2,000 years ago, uh, women were expected to be very unemotional. They were not expected to show inordinate emotion in public. Uh, women being kept apart, for example, in certain cultures or in certain times, um, certain in certain situations in order not to seduce men. The next few paragraphs are a documentation of that. She talks about uh, imagery in particular and how women have been portrayed, represented visu visually, visibly in paintings, uh, photographs, etc. as and, and how the that has changed over time from e expectation of women to hide their emotions because their emotions might be dangerous to women being expected to sell a certain image of themselves as happy, as content, as whole, uh, as a way to portray them as idealized and perfect and uh, properly submissive and domesticated. And this takes us up almost to uh, today and how um, in today, cheerful Americans, the smiling American is the, uh, in some sense, uh, stereotyped image of America, of the American, and um, an essential part of our advertising, right? A smiling woman, especially smiling at a product as, as one of the most cliched yet still ever-present images in our advertising. And she notes as an aside how this uh, smiling imagery is really particularly American, that in other cultures people don't smile as much, nor do they even, ad the, in their advertisements, they don't smile as much. She gives the story of uh, uh, Euro Disney and the first McDonald's in Russia and how American ad execs couldn't get the locals, even the, lo the local actors who were performing in the commercials, to smile for them because it just wasn't something that they did as part of their, uh, it wasn't something that people felt pressured to do, expected to do, in the same way that Americans, we seem to ex expect ourselves, and especially our women, to display a kind of happiness at all times. And I can say, just as a, a personal anecdote from my own experience, it is definitely true that people in other countries don't, uh, often don't smile as much. When I was in college, I had a good friend from the Ukraine, and he said, oh, people in Ukraine, they never smile. They, if you smile, they think you are an idiot and they hit you with lead pipe. Take all your money. Uh, and when we had a friend who, who was going to Ukraine, an American friend who was going there to study abroad, our, our, our friend from Ukraine said, do not smile. You smile too much. They will think you are an idiot. You must, uh, you must never smile at people. Or they will think you are a simple man. Uh, so, uh, yeah, definitely in other countries, smiling, uh, the smiling American can be interpreted in a very different way than we might interpret someone smiling. Okay, and she ends the this section by talking about uh, a historical change that's happened in recent decades, in the second half of the 20th century, um, as a way to, I guess, take us up to the present day. She notes that the smile burden, as she says, the people who were expected to smile um, and who weren't allowed to show other other emotions were primarily women and African-American slaves by the mid-19th century. Uh, and for both, uh, smiling or f smiles from both signaled deference, signaled uh, submission, right? The smiling slave was the slave who was happy, who was submissive, who was uh, content or at least thought to be content, the slave who you didn't need to worry about. Um, and so that became kind of a stereotype for uh, for black people in particular. 
And so she talks about how in the 1960s, when the civil rights movement was was in its uh, beginnings, that African-American men in particular stopped smiling in public. They didn't just smile as they were expected to, to show themselves as the happy, um, simple minded uh, slave or, or former slave or child of a slave. Um, that they rejected that expectation that they would just be happy-go-lucky, simple folk uh, and accept whatever was given to them. And so the refusal to smile was, uh, and you know, it's, it's something that's become a, a joke. There's jokes in Family Guy about black guys never smiling in, in pictures and things like that. So it's become something of a, of a joke, but it's, it has its powerful political roots as a refusal to accept the, the behavior, accept the personality that the dominant class that the dominant elements of society were pushing on them. And she says that's something that happened um, in the black community, but it's not something that's happened for American women. Uh, women still don't necessarily, many women don't feel that they have the power to express their anger, to express themselves as serious. They don't feel that they have the, the right to not smile. And she gives this very detailed example of a woman uh, be reacting in such a way um, to smile when, when asked to do something difficult or when asked to redo some work, uh, to smile when insulted, to smile when attacked, uh, that women are expected to behave in a certain way. And we can imagine that a man in the same situation uh, would be allowed to express a much wider range of emotions than a woman would be able to. And again, I won't go over the conclusion in detail because I already talked about it. Uh, she returns us to the original problem, to her own situation, gives us some examples of new developments, um, saying that, that even though this is something that's an issue, there, is, there are positive developments on the, on the horizon, and she expresses her own desire for change, her own goal. If a woman's smile were truly her own, to be smiled or not, according to how the woman felt rather than according to what someone else needed, she would smile more spontaneously without ulterior hidden motives. So this idea of the free smile, being able to smile when you want, not just because what you're ex expected to, that is her goal. And the goal of the essay as a whole uh, is to um, communicate the need, communicate what it feels like um, to be robbed of that ability to smile when you want. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Cunningham's response to her essay. A few years later, she went back, did some further research, and she actually changed her mind about a lot of the things she said in this essay. And I believe I included a copy of her, um, her, her response to her previous work in the uh, version that I, I gave to you all to read. Um, and the main thing is that she says, well, I had thought that fake smiles were just meaningless, that smiling when fake, wa uh, uh, smiling when you don't feel it was a sign of, she says, pathology, it was pathological, it's a sickness. Um, and she says, I was very invested in this idea that of women being um, under a kind of marginalization, women being under a sort of repression. And she says, I've since learned that, in fact, fake smiles can have a great positive effect, not only on the individual smiling, but on other people, that it can actually create authentic emotion. So smiling when you don't feel like smiling is not necessarily a bad thing. And I think that's a good point. I think she's, it's a good point that she, is, uh, that she has made. And the question is, does that, uh, or to what extent does that, um, challenge the ideas she'd expressed in the original essay. I think it does point us to something very important, that is that positivity can have an effect, that being positive, that smiling, that having a, a, a good outlook has a very real effect on one's own emotions, on one's health, on one's behaviors, uh, and on those around you. However, I don't think that necessarily totally erases the ideas that the, the issues that she brought up that there are certain social and cultural expectations that are predominantly placed on women to smile and to behave in a certain way and to not show uh, uh, 
one's emotions. I think there's a difference between cultivating harmony and smiling to try to cultivate harmony and smiling to submit, uh, to make yourselves complacent, right? Um, if so, so I don't think this new information is necessarily incompatible with her original conclusion and goal. I think it complicates things, but I think still we can understand um, and, you know, a, a, an experience that, that many women have that women just don't have is someone saying, hey, it's not so bad. You should smile. Why don't you smile, honey? Let's see those those uh, uh, pretty, pretty teeth. <laughs> anyone actually says let's see those pretty teeth uh but y you get my you get my drift people say hey smile i want to see your pretty smile uh, women and, and young girls far more than than young boys their parents tell them oh why don't you smile you want to look nice look happy why do you have a don't don't have hair that hangs down in front of your face everyone wants to see your pretty smile so from an early age um, I think it is definitely true that there are social and cultural expectations that are placed on women, and women are limited in uh, their ability to express their emotions uh, by our expectations. Does that mean that we shouldn't, that we should never fake smile, that you shouldn't sometimes smile to cultivate harmony? No, of course, sometimes it is, it is a good thing, uh, but it doesn't erase just the fact that, that smiling can create positive emotions where there were none before doesn't erase the gendered imbalance. So uh, with that in mind, again, just to review, I talked a little bit about the purpose of Cunningham's article, talked about the organization in the general sense, talked about the organization on a paragraph by paragraph level. And the idea here is to get a sense of how she moves from one idea to the other, how she connects the different issues um, and develops the different elements of her overall argument that, that smiling is something that has certain biological and natural reasons behind it, but those are transformed by culture into a whole set of expectations and prescribed behaviors. So how she develops that point and how she develops the different aspects of that and then ultimately comes back to tie it all together at the end of this short essay. So thinking about that organization as a way, as a model for your own way to organize, uh, for your own way to think about how to develop an idea to organize an argument. Okay, with that said, let's end this presentation. If you have any questions, please get in contact. Otherwise, I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in the next presentation.